Divine Truth Events Events and Presentations by Jesus and Mary This presentation is part of the general discussion series, where Jesus answers questions from people in Coco. Recorded on the 14th of September 2007 in Coco, Florida, USA. This is session one, part two. Have any of you heard of Share International? Pardon? Share International. Yes. Some of you have heard of Share International? Yeah. Benjamin Krem. Benjamin Krem? Yeah. Uh, Benjamin Krem is a man who's been for 40 years talking about the return of 14 masters of wisdom. Don't you have ever heard of that terminology? Right. The reason why is that seven pairs divide into 14. 14 yeah. two. And so he's been challenging this for some time. So it's been well known in the spirit world that there are there have, there have been seven who have seven pairs or fourteen people who have reincarnated. It's just that not many people on earth believe it, but one of them went back. What happened? Yeah. 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 One of them went back. Yeah, yeah jumping ahead. <laughs> Let me tell everybody who it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jesus and his soulmate. And his soulmate was Mary Magdalene. There's the Apostle John. And his soulmate. There's uh, a man called Cornelius and his soulmate. Cornelius was the man who killed Jesus. Actually nailed and nailed him to Jesus' hands and feet by the crucifixion. And there's uh, John the Baptist. And his soulmate, her name is Martha. Cornelius' is soulmate, his name is Nora. John, Apostle John's soulmate, his name is Nathaniel. Apostle John had a male soulmate. Uh, what are we up to? Oh, there's Elisa, Elisa and her soulmate. There's uh, John, Mark, and his soulmate. Oops. Her name's Tabitha. And there's Luke. Bible writer Luke. And his soulmate, and her name is Sarah. And she is Jesus' daughter. Jesus did have a So he did not die on the cross. No, Jesus did die on the cross. He did die. Mary was pregnant with his child, six months pregnant, and he died. There you go. So somebody asked who the seven were, or the fourteen. That's who they are. Are they on the earth now? Yeah, all but one. Uh, as was pointed out, the Apostle John has been murdered. And he is passed back into the spirit world. And they work in a. What, 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 what do they do? I mean, you mentioned, because you mentioned something about Share International. What does that mean? Uh, and I'm just saying that there, that there are many spirits in the spirit world who know that there are 14 people who have reincarnated. And I don't have any link with Share International. But Benjamin Krem has been channeling this for nearly 40 years. Benjamin Krem created sharing today. I have met John Baptist, and he's in Christian He's in Christian Korea. He actually grew up in Oklahoma. And by the way, a lot of people think that think that is people. That's all right. And we'll go through why that's the case too. 
Yeah, now, are these people you consider them saints or I'm trying to identify here? I just know. Or, people, right? or just uh, uh, enlightened people? or? Well, no, they just receive divine love to the point that we talk about, that's all. I beg your pardon? They've received divine love that enabled them to reach the 20 second sphere uh -huh. and return it. So they still have issues and things like that? Well, every time you, if you reincarnate, you are automatically impressed with the emotional condition of your parents. So straight away, you have to work through all of those emotional issues. Does that make sense? So each of the 14 have to work through emotional issues. So that's karma? That's uh, no, it's not karma. It's the emotional condition of the parent. Maybe I can explain it this way. And you know when you walk past, I don't know, who, who of you are afraid of dogs? Hmm? Afraid of dogs? Have been afraid of dogs in the past? Yeah. In the past? Did you notice that when you were afraid of a dog, a dog could feel your fear? Yeah. And you always seem to get into a situation where dogs wanted to attack you? Yes. You notice that? Why is that? Law of attraction. Well, they could feel your fear. Does that make sense? Yeah. So emotion, emotional states are transmitted to everything around you. Your soul is like this. Let's say your soul is full of unworthiness. Your soul is like a light beam and gun. I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy, right? It doesn't matter what you think. You might, you might be jogging along like I did for three years saying, I'm worthy, I'm worthy, I'm worthy. And you know, after three years of doing that, I still felt unworthy. <laughs> and I was still feeling this, unworthy, unworthy, unworthy. And I had a line up of people in my life who were exposing my unworthiness. In other words, they wanted to treat me as if I was unworthy as well, right? That's the law of attraction at work. Okay? Now, all of those emotions are within your soul. Every single mother has emotions within her soul. Every single father has emotions within his soul. And the impression of both sets of emotions, as soon as a person incarnates, gets impressed upon the soul of the person incarnated. In fact, that is where the majority of where your injuries came from. Right? And you acted upon those injuries as you grew up. Does that make sense? So what about free will? Does that kind of push aside free will? Remember when you first incarnate, you are not aware of free will. And it's only the experience that you begin to learn about free will. So free will isn't something you automatically know how to express to its greatest degree. Free will is something you learn how to express emotionally as you grow. You follow me? So while you have the potentiality of being totally free, often you're not until you learn how to be free. So how many of you feel like you worry about other people's opinion of you? Right? But if you worry about other people's opinion of you, are you free? No. No. How many of you feel like you're worried about what your parents think of you? Right? How many of you are angry with what your parents think of you? Right? Well, I'm telling you, you're controlled by that, right? <laughs> Does that make sense? Wait. Whenever emotion is within you, it controls you. So if you have an emotion of anger towards your parent, then that is controlling you whether you want to admit it or not, right? And this is the thing is that we are full of emotions, right? Now many times those emotions are what we classify as sad or I would classify in disharmony with divine love. Now any emotion that's in disharmony with love will cause you pain. And if you have a child, your pain will be felt by that child at the time of incarnation and onwards. And you think about it, that's how you got most of your injuries, isn't it? But just because it's felt doesn't mean they have to take it on. They have that choice of whether or not they want to take it on. Yes, but an undeveloped soul doesn't know what to choose until they start growing. So usually it's only in your teens or 20s that you start even being aware that you can choose certain emotions and, and reject others, you know, reject the transactions. But wouldn't that be what light children are about, that they're able to be a little bit more receptive about 
Yes, all of like what are called indigo children and all those kind of terminologies, what's happening is the parents have far less emotional injuries than the average parent historically. Does that make sense? So any child born from that parent is also going to have far less emotional injuries. So they are going to be far more connected to their soul. And in fact, the last of the 14 who incarnated um, was, was this girl here, Nora. And that happened in 1985. Actually, it happened in 1984. No, not 1985, wasn't she? And from that time on, you'll notice a lot of changes have been happening with regard to indigo children on Earth. And in fact, a lot of channel material has come out saying that children born after 1985 have a far greater, far greater capacity to experience emotion and to actually grow spiritually and emotionally than children before then. And the reason why is because the Earth state has changed quite markedly after that time. Right? You getting rid of your emotions, if you have a child, means that you give that child a beautiful gift of being emotionally free when it's born. Right? And that's going to give it a huge advantage in life. It doesn't work though when the child is well, the problem is the child is growing up in an environment, and the environment has a culture, it has a lot of injuries. You look at the USA environment, for example, and I don't mean to pick on you because of USA, but it's very similar here in Australia as well. Right? You look at how much in harmony way we are with our environment for Australia. How much harmony do we have with our environment, really? We wreck our environment, don't we? Really. But there's very few US cities you can fly over and see the ground. Clearly, right? When you look up to the stars at night, you don't see many of them in a the city, do you? Because we wreck the environment. There's so many things that we do, and our children are experiencing all of these things that are wrong with the world from the moment they start experiencing the world. So they also become out of harmony, you know, as they grow as well, because they're soaking in all the emotion. All of you pay taxes, yes? Yes. None of you have tried to not pay tax. Well, isn't tax a distortion of the reality? Really? When I say distortion of the reality, um, you don't need to pay tax, actually. There is another way that you could actually build roads and all those things, but do you really want to build roads? Is, are roads in harmony with the environment? So here we get some challenging things. Do you think... Do you think God wants you to build a road and knock down a heap of trees and build a road? What do you think? Like, do you think God wants you to kill food, kill animals? Do you think? Well, do you, have, do you think you can be in harmony with divine love and do it? No. See, a lot of times we feel we might be, you know, we're going to have to determine whether God is telling us something or not, aren't we? some stage, right? So that can be an individual thing. That's not a universal thing. That's an individual thing. God's truth is absolute. So there has to be a, a universal thing. There's always a, there is always an absolute truth. And I can guarantee you there is always an absolute truth about almost any question you can ask. The key is how to discover it. Right? So you know how we often hear the thing, oh, it's your truth, that's my truth. In your minds at the moment, you're probably thinking this is the way they speak, right? <laughs> and often that's the case, right? We feel that it's somebody else's truth. But I can guarantee to you that when you connect to God, you will get to a point at some point in your progression that you will no longer feel like you can eat meat anymore, for example. And you will feel every single time you do it a disconnection with God. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, while you may not believe that now, that's fine. Right? But, I, but I'm, I know from my own experience that every single time I've ever eaten meat, there's an instant disconnection with, with the flow of love. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. Now, if you choose to lie, just to lie, I can guarantee you, you'll get so sensitive in your soul at some point, 
that when you lie, you'll disconnect with God. Right? I'm guaranteed to you this will happen. Now, when it happens will depend on how much love is in the soul. Does that make sense? And, and you'll feel that connection flow, but you'll find that whenever you lie, whatever reason, even if you think it's a good reason, right? you'll find there will be a disconnection. You'll find there's a time whenever you're angry, you'll feel the disconnection with God. Whenever you are sad, you'll feel the disconnection with God. You will feel these things because none of these things are in harmony with being at one with God. Does that make sense? Do you think God gets sad? If God got sad, <laughs> we're in trouble, right? We have to go through all that experiencing it. I'm not saying don't experience it. Does that make sense? So I'm saying that when we are finished experiencing these emotions, we will get to a condition where we no longer feel sad. You'll get to a condition where you no longer feel angry ever again. No matter what anybody does to you, you still will not feel angry. Right? You will get to that condition at some point. In the progression of the divine love path, you will get to that condition. And when you do, any time you feel even just a tinge of sadness if you're on the earth, something happened, you'll feel the disconnection and you'll have to go within and find out what's happening within your soul that's caused that. Does that make sense? But you'll get to a point when you're one with God that you won't ever feel sadness again. On earth you can do this. Uh, I know it might sound like way out there, right? But on earth you can do this. Thank you. I might have chapter 14. When they came back, they took on their parents' injuries. But did they also bring back the memories of their at one minute with God? And yeah. God? yeah. But, but the process for them of remembering it yeah. is a process of having to work through their emotions. <coughs> you know what I mean? Just like, just like everyone else. <coughs> really? Does that make sense? So how can they help us if they're trying to be at the kind of the same level? Well, the first way they can help is to show you how to work through your emotions. And one of the best ways to show you that is to demonstrate that from their own life. Does that make sense? And the second thing is obviously as they do that, all of their memories return, and therefore they can tell you about what they've experienced. <coughs> and uh, so the 14 who are progressing are in that state where they have memories, and can tell you the things that they've experienced. Does that make sense? Obviously they can do that for very special particular reason, otherwise they wouldn't. Certainly. Obviously the first reason is... I'll buy it. But there's a reason why um, it's around about now, right? Because all, all of you know that the coming events on the Earth, you've all heard about coming events on the Earth, 2012 being critical years and so forth. And the reason why the 14 have returned at, at this critical time too is to help mankind through that process of transition. Does that make sense? But first they need to demonstrate the process of transition within their own souls. And that, that takes time, obviously. How do, you, how do the avatars fit into this and the people like Yogananda and some of these other people that have reached... Um, the bliss level or nirvana or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Buddha. Here's the sphere. Baba. Yeah. Yep, let's talk about that. What are the spheres? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, the sphere is the And remember I made the statement that almost all religious teachings on earth are related to the development of natural love. In fact, oftentimes the development in natural love is about detuning from your passions and desires. Have you heard of that? Detuning from your passions and desires. In other words, I don't know if any of you, did you have a visit by Dalai Lama uh, recently? Uh, we did in Australia. He talks about the detuning from his passions and desires. He was saying how he still occasionally looks at a woman and feels that sexual urge, but he says that it's not, you know, it's human far between, basically. 
Now, anything that causes you to detune from your passion and desire is not in harmony with divine love. Now, that's a, I've made a very blanket statement there. But when you think about it, for example, who created sex? God. So if you have to detune from sex to grow spiritually, does that make sense? No. no. Does that make sense? Now, on the natural love path, there are literally thousands and thousands of theories about how to progress spiritually. And one of the major theories is that Eastern philosophy that you need to become without desire to be blissful. Does that make sense? In other words, they feel that if you have desire, then you can never be blissful. And a lot of times they teach you about detuning from your passions and desires. Well, the divine love path is about tuning into your passions and desires and bringing all of your passions and desires in harmony with divine love. Now, what happens with many of the so-called avatars and everything? Almost every spirit who's in the sixth sphere calls themselves an avatar. They name themselves one, yeah. Well, you feel pretty good about yourself, right? By the time you get to six feet. Well, what's the difference between saying that and saying, I'm God? And there's many that say they're God there, right? So, so they actually feel they are, you know, they know the secrets of the universe. That's what they believe. Now, the spirits, ironically, the spirits that are on this path continue to say, I am God's child. <laughs> right? And they continue to say, I am your brother and sister. So they don't put themselves above you. Does that make sense? The spirits on a natural love path will certainly put themselves above you. And they'll call themselves avatars or you know, all sort of teachers or whatever else they call them, right? So on this path, often what happens is we get to a stage where we are so proud of our achievements right, that we want to let everybody else know what we've achieved too, right? On this path, it's totally different. You're a lot more humble than that. You just view yourself as another child of God. Now, many of those, have, what happens to the spirit, to people on earth? So here's half of the soul, on earth in a spirit form, right? And a material form. Right? Now, let's say that's a masculine soul. This very much occurs in India lots of times. These avatars connect with the soul of the people on earth. And actually, if you know what mediumship is, don't you? All of you know about mediumship? Um, oh, let's uh, define uh, it as when a person is a medium. If a person is a medium, what it means is that they have a clear, or maybe a semi-clear, connection with, spirit, with the spirit world and can hear and feel impressions and see spirits. Now, I'm here to tell you that all of you can be that. But some people are born with that. It's just like some people are born artists, some people are born musicians, and some people are born with that natural ability stronger than others. Right? Now, when you're very, very young in a meeting, there's spirits who, on the, particularly on the, the sixth bit, on the natural love path, who will connect with you because they see it as an opportunity to teach everyone around you. Does that make sense? Now, what a lot of spirits have done, and particularly in eastern lands like India and so forth, they actually connect to the child when it's, when even sometimes before its birth, because the mother is open to it, they connect to the child before birth and they remain connected with that child for the rest of its life on earth. Right? And they continually channel and information and also healing and all, all sorts of other things through that child as it's growing up. So the other part also good. It's good. Yeah, it's a good thing then, right? Well, it's a good thing in the sense that it uh, is certainly helping the human race raise their level of love, natural love. It's not a good thing if you're looking at the issue of free will. 
because it's interfering with the free will of the child uh, in, in a way that uh, and a divine love spirit would not do. Does that make sense? The divine love spirit wouldn't choose to do this. Yes. Can it be distracting? It can certainly be distracting. Yeah, all of you have heard of Sabah? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Have, what have you heard now? You would have heard conflicting things, right? On one hand, you hear that he does all these wonderful things. And on the other hand, you hear that there's some sexual things that he gets up to. But they're not so good, right? So what's going on? What's going on is Sabah himself is in a first sphere condition. But he has a spirit with him who's in a sixth sphere condition. And that spirit is constantly connected with him. How do you know that? He has a soul of spear devotees of Sai Baba, so you're going to have to explain something to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't have to believe a single thing, and to be honest with you, I don't have to explain either. If I didn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> However, I will. statements of things that I've already investigated and found out and I know that I know to be true but my stating them won't you won't feel they are true until you investigate them does that make sense and I all I'm doing is saying to you what I know to be true now the reason why I state it so firmly is because I know it firmly I know that it's truth but and um, I understand that a lot of times that comes that can come across as like I know truth or whatever, it might come across badly, but I'm just stating the truth. That's the way I see it. Um, and that's my role. Does that make sense? My my desire is just to state the truth as it is. Now, I've talked to spirits who are around Say Baba and talked to people who have met him and also investigated through the connections with spirits on the divine love path, what's going on with them. Does that make sense? And the total tap the totality of that investigation is that there is a six-year spirit who has been connected to St. Baba since the time of since the time he was in his mother's womb. And who has kept that connection with St. Baba all this time. The problem for Say Baba is that his soul condition when he passes is going to be into the first sphere. And he will feel that when he passes. Does that make sense? At the moment it's like a fictitious condition in the sense that the sixth sphere spirit is so heavily influencing him that, that he believes himself also to be in that condition. Does that make sense? And the problem with that is that when he passes he will go into the first fear condition and then he will have to work out why there's this discrepancy. Right? And by the way, this is happening not just with that man, but also with many, many others who are calling themselves avatars on earth. The majority of them are actually connected with very strongly with spirits on the natural love path who are willing to do this for what they see to be the benefit of the human race. Well, I thought you couldn't incarnate into 
until you got to number 22. Yep. Or they're just impressing there. Yes, he, say God, believes himself to be an incarnation, a reincarnation. But in reality, there is a connection just with the spirit going on. And there is no, has been no reincarnation for him. He, has, he is not a reincarnated soul. Well, who is that spirit he's connected with? Oh, I don't know the spirit's name. They don't have names in this. Is well, that spirit must be elevated? And um, well, he's in the sixth day condition, which is the highest possible condition you can be in without connecting to divine life. So he is in a very good condition, the spirit is. But he's willing to sacrifice, say, Barbara's free will to maintain the connection. And many six fear spirits are willing to do this. I'll have to get back to this question about the twin foil. Is it, any of my questions related to that, or have I answered the question about say Barbara? Some. Some. <laughs> we can talk a lot more about the process of reincarnation in the, at another time, but. The important thing to understand is that every single person on earth now can develop a very close relationship with spirits. I know people who have sex with spirits. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> because most, most of the spirits we try are going to be in the first year. But I do know people who have sex with spirits. I do know people who are connected with spirits who can do all sorts of things while they are connected with the spirit. But as soon as the spirit connection is broken, no longer can they do those things. Right? So it's the spirit maintaining that power through the individual. Does everyone want to have more about this subject? And then we get to 2012 or? What did you know about Yogananda? Where he fit in all of that? Very, very similar. You've heard of the Diksha and those kind of, uh, the oneness blessing and all those things. You, you know how there's, every one of them describes a golden ball entering the being, and they call that divine love. It's not divine love, it's a spirit entering them. It's a spirit from, of higher development entering the person. That's why there's an instant change. If there's any, if you make any instant changes, there's a pretty good chance there's a spirit involved. So that is, that is, that's not a loving thing. It's if you want to be on the divine path. On the divine love path, spirits step back from you because they are talking about your free will. It's your relationship with God, right? That's what they want you to develop. So they are not going to make instant changes in you because they know from their own experience that it's going to be an emotional process you're going to need to work through. You are going to need to work through those emotions with God. Does that make sense? Yes. But that's kind of a clue. If it's fast change, it's like If it's a rapid change, when I say people on the divine love path do change rapidly, but when I say rapidly, I don't mean like that. I mean over months and months of emotional work, they feel completely different. Does that make sense? Now, any change that happens like that on earth, from what I have seen in every single case, a spirit has been involved. Even if it's a negative change. Like, you know of schizophrenia, for example. Schizophrenia, a spirit is involved. Right? You know of manic depression. In manic depression, a spirit is involved. Right? All of these things that cause these kind of quick changes or quick changes in personality and all those kind of things, well, a spirit is involved. Their condition depends on what happens. So in the case of schizophrenia, many times they're drawn towards drugs or, or you know, the, the voice in their head is a real person talking to them. Many of those voices in their head telling them to kill themselves, right? So where do you think they are coming from? Our first fear spirits who are in a terrible condition telling the person they'll be better off dead. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So how do we protect ourselves from that? We'll talk about that's a very important point that's been raised a couple of times already, and I want to talk about that before we go tonight. And what's the time? Eight thirty. Eight thirty.
Is it right, Cindy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, 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 I say we need to go to 2012. Okay. What, what I'll do is I'll answer 2012 question and then briefly yeah. answer the question about how to protect yourself. And then I think we should finish tonight. Um, and then tomorrow we will further this discussion and lots of questions as well. How does that sound? Um, um, loose stop, pit stop, we call it a loose stop. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to have a little break, five minutes? Just uh, in five minutes? I'll just write down the subject. So, uh, <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and also those who are already Marie, you're in the front row. I moved out to us. We moved up. That's the only way for us. And therapists. All right, let's uh, let's focus on that question of the 2000s world first. Um, Historically, many spirits, including spirits in the natural love path, have known that there are major earth changes coming from the earth. Many of them don't know why changes are happening on the earth. When I say happening on the earth, I don't mean to people. I mean changes happening on the earth to the earth, to the planet. Historically, all of you would have heard of Atlantis and Memoria and those, those kind of things. Well, historically what's happened is every time mankind's condition has got into a very bad state, and there's been major cataclysmic change on the earth as a result of man's condition. The reason why this is the case is because your soul, if I just focus a little bit on your soul, your soul is your passions, your desires, your intentions. Your longings and many other things too. We'll discuss uh, tomorrow in a lot more detail. Many men today on earth, and I mean mankind generally, not men, just men, and women too, have a desire to continue doing things that damage the earth. Right? If you look uh, at the country you live in, for example, you can see quite easily. That the actions of each person are damaging the earth. But I don't know if you're aware, but just one home generally produces around 60 tonnes of greenhouse gases. Right? So one home produces around 60 tonnes of greenhouse gases. So there's a huge amount of damage that's happening onto the earth. Now, the damage comes because the passions, desires, and intentions, and longings of each individual person is being exercised in disharmony with love. Does that make sense? Yes. That's how, why it happens. So, what's happening is that if you want to stop damage to the earth, the first thing you need to start addressing is your passions, desires, longings, and intentions. You follow me? Yes. Now, the reason why 2012 is, has been a pivotal year is because many spirits over the last quite a few centuries have predicted that the Earth's um, problems would reach a climax at around that time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because of the condition of men. Predicted or projected? Predicted. No, no, it's not destined. Uh, when pro projected probably yeah. is, a, like is a better word. What's going on, say. Yeah. From a spirit's perspective, you imagine for a moment that you're a spirit. Like, right at the moment, who of you has husbands that are not here? <laughs> <laughs> Alright? If you were a spirit, you'd be able to see what they do on the right hand of the world. 
So if you have an inquisitive or a suspicious nature, <laughs> so so this is the thing you see is that in the spirit world there's a lot more information available to you. Does that make sense? You have the ability to investigate things far more rapidly than you do here on earth. And so spirit, many spirits are in a position where they can um, work through the many things that are happening and come up with predictions or what what they foretell to be future events. And many of these events were foretold, like even back in the 18, late 1800s. Uh, you've heard of, uh, it's a Madame Blavatsky. Um, uh, she was channeled, a channel back then, uh, and she received a lot of information about the damage that was happening to the earth. And then you've heard of Edgar Casey and these ones, mm -hmm. and they received a lot of information. But you notice that every one of them have had predicted time frames, like Edgar Casey initially predicted the 50s, which was time of great cataclysmic change, and then later in his life he predicted it would be before the year 2000. And You've heard of Gordon Michael Scarlet? Um, predicted Earth changes. He believed that they would all occur before 2000, year 2000. The reason why all these predictions don't come true is because it's far more complicated than a, than a six year spirit is able to calculate. The reason why is because a spirit on the divine love path knows much, much more about the soul. Spirit on the natural love path knows very little about the soul. And as a result, the spirit on the natural love path, the path developing natural love, predicts everything based around what they can see occurring, and they don't see what's happening in the soul. Does that make sense? Now, the reason why I brought all that into this thing of 2012 is that your soul has the capacity to change the events. Your soul has the capacity to change the intensity of the events and the timing of the events. Just your soul, one soul. To give you an example, one soul that reaches the eighth sphere of the spirit world compensates for nearly a billion other souls on earth who are not who are in the first sphere. Does that make sense? Compensates in degrees of love. The love, the love of an eight-sphere spirit is a billion times more powerful than the love that can be exercised by a first-sphere spirit. Follow me? Now, you can see straight away that if, if a person progresses to the eight-sphere on Earth, that can have a huge effect on everything here on Earth, including what's getting projected to the Earth itself. Does that make sense? So, the first thing to bear in mind is with any of these predictive things, is that your soul, as it changes, can change the intensity and the timing of these events. And the reason why 60 spirits haven't been able to accurately foretell the events is because they don't know the power of the soul. A, a spirit in the sixth year on the natural love path can only compensate for a thousand souls in the first year in terms of what they know and realise. So it's very, very different on the divine love path and natural love path. So any comments that I make about the earth's changes right now can be changed by your actions that you take from now on. Does that make sense? So therefore, nothing I say about earth changes right now can ever be treated as if it's going to occur for sure. Because you have the power to change it. And in fact, I do too. My own condition raising can also change it. Does that make sense? So if you are focused on changing your emotional condition, a lot of these events that would currently happen right now may not happen. Or if they do happen, may be delayed. So that being said, what kind of events will occur? Well, at the moment, some very major events are going to occur. If things continue exactly as they are now. When I say major events, your entire west coast of the USA and right up to Vancouver is going to have some very major cataclysmic events which will cause millions and millions of people to pass in just a few events. 
This area of Florida, um, south down south ways around the Miami region and down there, obviously is it's been well known for some time, is in, in a state of trouble. And the coming events will probably mean uh, that all of that will be underwater. Now, there's also regions out in the Atlantic that are going to rise out of the sea as well. And uh, how much all of these changes occur will depend totally upon the soil condition of people changing in between now and those events occurring. In Australia, the destruction is going to be quite disastrous if it continues as it is now. In that uh, the majority of Australian cities will be destroyed aside from perhaps two of them. No, the events will begin probably in 2007. And in fact, if, up until recently, it was looking like they would occur in a couple of weeks' time. In fact, it's looking like the West Coast events of the USA were going to occur before September 30th. But because of some changes in soil condition, and that those events have also been delayed. The trigger event for all of the events is still probably going to remain the same, and that is, you know the western seaboard of the USA, from Vancouver Island all the way down, what is it, to San Francisco and further down. In Vancouver Island area, there's this, there's a plate here, I don't know if you know, it's called the one the plate. Why don't you know it? I don't know if you know about plate tectonics, but and what happened is there's this Pacific plate moving in that direction. This Wahoo Fulga plate is moving in that direction. Now you can see that the Pacific plate is butting up against this plate, and this plate is preventing the Pacific plate from moving very much. This plate here will suck up under the coast, uh, under the under the USA. This is where all the volcanoes are in the USA, like the uh, Hoos and uh, San Helens. When that occurs, this plate can move with, with freedom, and uh, there's going to be huge movements along that. Uh, this is a shear fault. This is a subduction fault. There will be huge, huge movements along that shear fault, and which will mean all of the areas, all of the cities and towns along that coast, obviously are going to have major effects. That is the trigger event for a number of plate tectonic movements around the Earth. And everyone, the Earth, as you may be aware, is, a, is like it's like a series of plates floating on a molten sea. Right? And these plates get recycled. The Earth is constantly recycling itself. Right? And it's a natural movement, but it all happens in major changes due to the soil condition of man. And the other time, the other time in history where the major changes occurred was the time of Atlantis and Minoria. Whole continents, in fact, disappeared uh, within a few months uh, because of the changes. And there is the potentiality of continents or, or whole countries disappearing in the coming events as well. Countries like Japan, for example, may disappear completely. So the key thing, though, is that as your soil condition improves, the intensity and timing of these changes will change. Everything changes, and so while what? So there is two things in terms of answering your question. One is yes, there will be physical effects on Earth for change, and it is unavoidable unless. Huge numbers of people. Um, when, when I say huge numbers, obviously, if lots of people get on the divine love path, then it doesn't need to be as huge numbers. But as people progress on the divine love path, major, major things can change. Ma major changes that are cataclysmic will be lessened. But there is also a spiritual aspect in that. Almost every single person who's alive on Earth today is aware in their sleep state that these events are going to occur. And because of that, almost every single person has made choices about where to live, what they're going to do, 
And this, the earth is in a real state of change. And all of you probably can start feeling you're in a state of change too, right? Even emotionally, you've probably noticed that there's certain emotions within you changing that you've never changed before. And all of this is a part of all of these things that you're becoming aware of in the sleep state. And in the awake state, so when you're awake on earth, you're starting to become consciously aware of these things as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's some groups that are praying for people to become aware of their desire to evolve or whatever. Is that the really help or is it just your choice? Um, let's, prayer certainly helps if you understand it. The problem today on earth is that most people don't understand prayer. Here's your soul. What did I say it was? Emotions. Memories. Emotions. There's God's soul. What do you reckon a prayer might be? How does, Thank you. how does this soul talk to this soul? Through prayer, by emotions. By emotions. So when you direct your emotions towards God, that is a prayer. Does that make sense? Now, you can do that without even having a thought. You can actually direct your emotions towards God almost in a constant manner without even thinking about it. You know, let's say, let's say you see somebody really hurting. There's nothing you can do about it, but you really would like to do something about it. Well, that's a prayer. The fact that you really wanted to do something about it, if you direct that want to God, that becomes a prayer. Does that make sense? It's that simple. That's what prayer is. And those prayers that Maybe answer. All of those kind of prayers will be answered. However, there's another aspect of prayer, and that is God only answers prayers that deal with uh, causes. Do you understand what I mean by that? Yeah. All right. Um, what is the cause of the destruction of the earth? Three us. Disharmony, emotional disharmony, isn't it? It's emotions inside of us that cause us to desire things that are not in harmony with love. Does that make sense? That's what causes all of this other disharmony. So what would be an appropriate prayer? If we're dealing with causes, the appropriate prayer would be that we long for people to become aware of their emotions of disharmony and become aware of how to deal with it. Does that make sense? That would be a very appropriate prayer. An inappropriate prayer would be, God, come and fix this problem we've got in Florida on the, down the south on the east side of the pollution. Can you see why? What caused the pollution? The emotional disharmony inside of men, right? So if God rubbed out the pollution, would the pollution come back? Yes. Yes. God won't fix anything where it's going to return. You think about it, when you get rid of causes, and I have a whole discussion a few people have met up with me earlier in the week, we had a whole three hour discussion about this whole, this one aspect of cause and effect. Right? It's a very um, simple, it's a very simple thing to understand that God will not answer prayers that only deal with effects. Because it's a pointless exercise when you think about it, isn't it? Right? It's a bit like, you know, um, trying to fix something in your life when it's only the effect of what the real cause is. You have to fix the real cause, then the problem is fixed, the good isn't it? Yeah. And it's the same with God. God fixes problems for good only when the cause is addressed. And God, by the way, doesn't fix the problem. God makes aware to man the truth by your prayer, by a heap of synchronistic events, and that's what causes man to become aware of how the problem is repaired. 
But a prayer, an appropriate prayer is a, a prayer is always an emotion directed towards God. Does that make sense? This, by the way, connects with this thing called protection. If you think about it. If you have an emotion inside of you where you want power, let's say that's emotions inside of you, and there's a spirit around who wants to manipulate you, and you want power, can you see that your desire for power is going to attract the spirit who also desires power? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And he's going to connect with you and make you feel powerful. So how do you protect yourself from that? What you need to do is release from yourself the desire for power. Does that make sense? So in other words, it's going to require, protection requires a thing called release or emotional release, right? If you want protection from God, you need to work in harmony with God's laws. God's laws, one of them is called the law of attraction, which you've heard of, right? Now, the law of attraction is taught by the secret and all these other ones teach the law of attraction in order to do this. Mostly that's what they teach. But that's not true, is it? The law, you know, you can imagine things here, but it doesn't really feel like it. The law of attraction is to do with what you feel, what you really feel. So, for example, let's say we've got a lady who's uh, in an abusive partnership, an abusive relationship. What is the law of attraction doing? Okay. She wants to be in the abusive relationship. Now, I can guarantee you that no lady in an abusive relationship thinks she wants to be in it. Right? So here she's thinking, I don't want this, I don't want this, I'm tired of this, this is terrible. And she cries about it maybe even daily, right? This is what's going on here. But what's going on in here is, I am unworthy, I am worthy to be abused. I am worthy to be abused, I am worthy to be abused, goes this light, right? And so what happens is, a long line-up of people who are willing to abuse her appear in her life, including her closest partnership. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, she can change everything she wants here. She can change anything she wants here, but it will have no effect. Because until she releases from within herself, this desire to be abused, which comes from a desire, from a feeling of unworthiness, from feeling like, you know, she's worthless, right? If, until she releases the worthlessness, she is basically like this lighthouse saying to the rest of the world, I am worthless, abuse me, I am worthless, abuse me. Does that make sense? And until she comes to recognize that and take responsibility for that emotion and release it, when I say responsibility, not blame, she needs to be responsible to feel the emotion. She's the only one that can, because it's in her. So she needs to release that emotion. If she releases that emotion, then what's coming out is, I am worthy, I am worthy. If you abuse me, you're going to be out the door, right? <laughs> That's what happens from there on, right? Does that make sense? Now, it's exactly the same in all aspects of your life. So, your life tells you what you feel, even if you don't know what you're feeling. Right. So, if you're walking along a street, or let's say this week, how many of you had people angry with you this week? Yeah? People angry with you this week? Yeah? Okay. You needed that. You wanted that. Not here. But here you need it to trigger some fear. Because in here there's fear, and the only way to get it out is for somebody to trigger it. Does that make sense? Is there another way? Oh, yes, there is another way. And that is you, <laughs> I like that. you deal with your fear without getting a fear. But most people don't do that, right? <laughs> most people avoid their fear until it's triggered. Does that make sense? So the answer to all of your questions are basically, Deal with your emotions now. Don't wait until they have to be triggered. But to do that, you're going to have to get really honest with yourself. And that's what we'll talk a lot about tomorrow. Uh, so this aspect of protection, you'll have a lot of answers about that tomorrow because 
Protection from spirits is exactly the same as protection from anyone else. And that is, the law of attraction is attracting them into your life, whether they be spirits or people. The law of attraction operates upon your real condition. So, you think about it from the point of view of a person who has an instant change into mediumship, and they happen to get really dark in the process, right? What's happening? Often, many people who are mediumistic want power. They want people to take notice of them. They want to have a special gift. Does that make sense? Now, that desire is a desire for prominence, is it not? If you desire prominence, who do you think you're going to attract? A spirit who desires prominence. Does that make sense? A spirit who can manipulate that. The same goes if, let's say, you're in a state of internal fear. What kind of a spirit are you going to attract? A spirit who's willing to abuse your fear, to make you feel more afraid and to manipulate you, right? Does that make sense? Let's say, you're, let's say you look for sexual satisfaction through relationships to make yourself feel good. What kind of spirits are you going to attract? Spirits who are interested in using you for sex. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's all to do with what's going on in here. And that's the kind of stuff that you know we need to spend a lot more time on, obviously, because that's what... When we talk about... I'll use the term tomorrow a lot called soul development. Right? What do you reckon I'm talking about developing? Your passions, your desires, your emotions, your feelings. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what it means to be developing in yourself. And I'm going to talk about how to connect to God in that process. To help you through that process of developing. And ironically, as you connect to God, the truth flows through this process as well. And what happens is you will feel the flow of love through your soul, but also through even your physical form, you feel it, through your physical form. And the moment, the instant you do something in disharmony with truth, with God's truth, with absolute truth, you will not feel that feeling. And you'll get to the point one day where you'll feel that feeling all the time. Does that make sense? And every time you don't feel it, you'll know straight away, I just thought something, I just did something, I just said something, I just felt something. That was our mind with absolute truth. It's quite that simple. Right? Does that make sense? So if the divine love isn't isn't flowing through, we're talking about what it feels like tomorrow in the fair bit more. If it's not flowing through you and you're not feeling it all the time, then it's because right at this moment there's a feeling inside of you that's out of harmony with it. And it's up to you to find it. Does that make sense? And it's only your desire that can find it. Nothing else. You have free will. God's not going to force you to find it. Right? He's going to wait until you want it. When you are ready, then he has to produce what is he going to do. Not when you're ready, no. Okay. What did I say earlier? When you want to. When you truly want to. So, well, when, when we often use the term, am I ready, we sort of, it's almost like we're suggesting that some magical thing is going to happen and I'll be ready. Does that make sense? But in reality, the magical thing is what will happen is you will have a desire to do it. That's, that's what you're waiting for. Who controls your desire? I do. I control my desire. You control your desire, don't you? I can't control your desire. Oh, God yeah. can't control your desire. That bad spirit. No, no. no, no. See, this is the thing. No bad spirit controls your desire. Right? He can certainly tweak you a bit, right? but it has to be there within you already. Yeah. So you, you can't blame anyone else. Like, the devil made me do it, right? I like that. The, the key thing with all desire is to understand that it comes from within you. Desire is nourished. Look, at one stage, who of you are in a relationship? 
Yeah? At one stage you weren't in that relationship, yes? What made you desire to have this relationship? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't, when you think about it, you met, wasn't there a development where you started to get to know each other and you felt no. attraction? Yes? So at one stage the desire wasn't there and the desire was nourished by you and the other and the action of the other person and eventually there was a desire there that caused you to get together. Yes. yes. It's exactly the same desire. And it's exactly the same with every other relationship. It's all about your desire. You can nourish a desire, you can make it grow, or you can destroy it. You have that control. It's your soul. It's your free will. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Is that part of those two questions sufficient? Still, yeah, I'm more clarifying with the protection, but I think tomorrow you should be willing to talk about it. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a lot about that tomorrow because true protection of your soul results. <laughs> from you no longer having emotions within you that can be manipulated. Does that make sense? So the only, the only way a spirit can manipulate you is by your having an emotion that he can manipulate. The only way a person on earth can manipulate you is by your having an emotion that they can manipulate. Right? So you'll get to a stage, in fact, where after you've released lots and lots of your emotions, you get to a stage where every emotion that's projected at you will just sort of, it won't resonate with you anymore. Does that make sense? It, it doesn't motivate you anymore. So like, about three years ago, I had so many emotions of unworthiness that when I was talking in a group like this, I could, uh, the problem as you develop is you can feel every single person's emotions. I can actually feel all of your thoughts that have been projected at me as well. I can pick each person out. And tell you what you're thinking. I don't know. I won't do what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I feel it. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, if I've got unworthiness within me, and half of you are thinking, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> then that, and if I've got unworthiness, that resonates with the unworthiness. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I just feel worse. Yeah? But if I don't have the unworthiness feeling within me, you can think I'm a complete idiot if you want, right? And it's not going to have any effect on. It has to that. It's, a, it's about releasing the passions, desires, intentions, and emotions within you that are disharmonious with love. But how do you release it now? I have I'll talk about that tonight. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because you can sit there and allow this feeling to come. I've done a lot of work with the controlling mm -hmm. and uh, Gary Zubrock. Mm -hmm. And yet, I'm not running from the feelings, I am I'm confronting them, I'm sitting through them. But the back, it, it's not... It's not released. It's not released. That's so it. so there is something there that's... And that's missing. the main thing that's missing with all of this spiritual stuff right. that we talk about when we talk about that. There is a right. way to release, yeah. Right. And, and, and yeah. I'll give you a clue. You know when you feel sad, who sits there and feels sad? Right. Are you are you crying your eyes out at the time? Yes. No, no yes. No. Yes. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Okay. Sometimes. If you're sad and you're not crying, then you're not feeling your sadness. Right? You are just sitting in this stagnant state where your emotion is not in motion. Remember, emotion is energy in motion. Does that make sense? Emotion is energy in motion. If the energy, sad, is not in motion, crying, 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 then you are not feeling the feeling. Does that make sense? Secondly, remember I said there was a thing called cause and effect. If you're just crying about effects, you will not release the cause. So, for example, the lady I mentioned earlier who's in an abusive relationship, every single day she can cry about being in her abusive relationship, can't she? Every day she might get hit, she cries about that, she goes to a shelter, she goes back to the fellow, gets hit, cries about that, feels about that, and she may stay in that. She will stay in that for as long as it takes for her to connect to the cause, 
which is to feel the unworthiness within her soul and actually release that. Now, unworthiness is a very hard, deep emotion to feel. And when you feel it, you'll go through days and perhaps even weeks. With God, you will usually do it through days and weeks. If you do it by yourself, you'll do it for years. Like, uh, I tried it by myself for a while first, but <laughs> seven years later, it's still with it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's what you will do too, right? If you do it by yourself, you'll find years and years later, it will still be there. If you do it with God, you'll find within months or even days, it can be gone. But you need to be willing to experience the emotion completely. And it means connecting with the cause of the unworthiness. So you'll find that event after event after event will just flow up into your consciousness if you do it this way, of the childhood that caused you to feel unworthy. Does that make sense? And you'll need to process that. You'll need to feel it. And so we'll talk a lot more tomorrow about the process of feeling your emotions and connecting. Can I just stop for a moment, though? Who needs, wants to go? Yeah? And I think probably now is an appropriate time then to stop. And uh, and then those of you who want to come back tomorrow, uh, we can come back tomorrow, because we've been going over three hours already. Uh, and I, I don't like, I know, I know when the bottoms are numb, it's the right. hearing, the hearing, hearing sort of thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your time. Tomorrow we'll be having a, we'll answer a lot of these questions. I was also thinking about doing a small discussion with some spirits as well tomorrow who have been here today who wanted to ask some questions. Because uh, I've been conscious of some spirits that have been wanting to ask some questions as well. So if you, I think you might find that interesting, just talking to some spirits and finding out what they know about yes. these spiritual friends. Um, and it'll probably be from I think about it's 10 a.m. at the beginning, and we'll probably need to finish uh, before about one one o'clock. We'll try and make it um, tomorrow uh, as the as the end time. Sounds good, thank you.